Hey everyone, this is Ecclesia Fire Ministries again. Uh, I want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas, since this is going to be airing real close to Christmas. And we don't know uh, what's going to be going on with the, the videoing schedule with the holidays, but you know we'll, we'll see how it goes. But I did want to get this out here for you all. And um, today I wanted to talk about just the story of the gospel story of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, Father was just directing me a couple days ago in the spirit on just giving out the pure milk of the word. And so I wanted to just really go through, starting from the beginning and telling the story. Now, that could take a long time if you wanted to get into every possible detail. So it'll certainly be abbreviated, but we'll get in here in the history of where it all started, okay? So, you know, the Bible says um, that when God created Adam and Eve, he put them in the garden there, and that there was a tree of life and a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And really, what that sets up is is two main paths. One path was where they started with Adam walking in the cool of the day with God and learning from him in the journey, in his relationship. The other path was that, okay, yeah, you can access the knowledge of good and evil, but if it's apart from relationship, It'll kill you because it's only in the relationship and in the walk with God that there's power to walk that out properly. And some people might think, well, why did God even give that option? Well, he had to for free will. You know, it's not really free will if you don't even have the option to choose any other pathway other than God. So he had to make that possible so that at, on Judgment Day, you could say, all right, listen, I gave you the options, and you chose not to do the right thing. Otherwise, they might be able to say, well, you didn't even give me the option, you know. But anyway, God had to do that. And, and without free will, you can't love, right? You can't make the free will choice to love. Forced love isn't real love. So we have these two choices. And really, when you start to look at this, all religion is a cheap substitute for a relationship with God. Because religion... By, by terms of how the world looks at it, I, I understand James 1 says pure and undefiled religion is, is you know, helping widows and the fatherless and, and visiting people in hospitals and the prison and things like that. But the way that most people look at religion and how it's viewed in the world is we, we take a sinner of some kind, whatever, whatever viewpoint that religion has, and the burden of whatever type of salvation there is in that belief system, that the burden of that salvation is put on the person. It's put on the sinner. With Christianity, the burden of salvation is put on the Savior instead of the sinner. And the reason for that is because it's just logical. If God knows that you are imperfect and therefore cannot attain perfection, then it would be silly to try to make up some type of set of rules where if you'll perfectly follow these rules, you will somehow attain this salvation. You'll earn your way into heaven. Well, not everybody has a perfect record, right? <laughs> Only children are innocent. So once you become aware of sin, like how the Bible talks about the, you know, the age of accountability and where you willfully choose to do the wrong thing, 
what that does to you, and it's happened for every single human that's ever lived, is it causes separation between you and God. Because God cannot dwell with sin. And so now there's a problem. And the problem is, okay, we have this sinful nature that we get from Adam, who sinned in the garden, who chose the wrong path. And even if it wasn't him, it would have been someone else because everybody's made that wrong choice in their life to do something wrong. And now that we have this sin nature, that we're born with it, that the, the Bible says that the heart of man is desperately wicked. You know, people, as, as you can see with the Holocaust and a lot of other examples, can go into deep depravity. They can become exceedingly wicked. And so there is this problem. And the problem is, how can God judge his children for all the evil in the world, but at the same time also give them mercy? Because he's a perfect judge, and he has to judge for evil done but at the same time he also loves us and wants to be merciful towards us so this sets up the need for the savior this sets up this logical requirement where if man cannot save himself out of his sin then god must be the only one that can and there are many who will say there are many paths to heaven. There are many ways to heaven. But that actually doesn't make sense because there's only one person that could die in our place to take all that judgment upon themselves, to take all of that on themselves in our place because there's only one who is perfect, and that's God. And that only one person was the only one person to die for our sins in our place. So when you have this only one Savior, it makes sense when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father except by through me. You know, there's, there's two types of people that say they are God either God or a terrible person. <laughs> you know, you got to be pretty messed up to call yourself God if you're not God. But he, God, is God. And he did say, I'm the son of man, which to the Jews, they knew what that meant. And so Jesus comes on the scene to die for our sins God incarnates himself into this earth. But let's go back a little bit and talk about some of the history leading up to this to help you understand. All right, so knowing that religion is a cheap substitute for relationship, you have this time where Abraham is met by God, and God tells Abraham okay, this is what I need you to do. I need you to perform a covenant ceremony with me. Now, in the ancient world, this ceremony consisted of digging a trench and then taking a number of different animals. And God instructed Abraham, cut them in halves. So he literally saws them in half and he puts the pieces of the animals on each side of the trench so then it fills with blood. And as weird as that sounds, that was an ancient covenant practice. Basically, it was that if I break this covenant, let it be done unto me what was done to these animals, basically. And so God tells him to do this, and he knows what this is about. It's in his culture. He understands. So he prepares this sacrifice. He prepares this covenant ritual. And what they would do is they would stand there in front of each other, two people making a covenant. Covenant's way more than just a contract. And they would trade weapons. They would trade belts. And depending on the culture, some things might be different here and there, but 
basically each person's enemies would become the other man's enemies okay you would have to fight to the death to defend a covenant person in your life if you made covenant with that person then that meant you fight to the death you spend all of your resources to protect this person and so houses would come into covenant with each other for defensive things in the ancient world and so god prepares this but here's the deal after they would trade these items they would walk in this uh, figure eight symbol which is like the infinity symbol for this covenant never ends well what happens is god puts abraham to sleep he causes him to have to go into a deep sleep the bible says and scripture says there's a burning torch of a fire that appears among the pieces of the sacrifice and it says it walks among the pieces well, what is that that was jesus coming down and manifesting in that form to walk among the pieces because if abraham would have walked that path then abraham and mankind basically would have had to die for breaking that covenant but when god walked among those pieces alone he was putting all the responsibility upon himself basically saying if this covenant's ever broken i will be the one that has to die for it it is the most one-sided agreement and, <laughs> and deal that that anyone could ever possibly have you know it's not like two equal houses coming together to combine their strength it's man coming into covenant with the almighty god who has no limits but only god has to take the ramifications for breaking the covenant it is ridiculously one-sided and so this begins the Abrahamic covenant. Now, it was agreements, and, and, and there were righteous men before Abraham, and so on and so forth. But focusing on Israel's line, we continue on. Okay. So let's just um, fast forward to Moses' day now. So Moses comes along, and God uses Moses to instate a large-scale animal sacrifice system in the temple. And what the purpose for that was is it was a temporary solution. It was a band-aid over sin. It didn't completely wipe away the record of sin. It would just cover it. Because the Bible says, God says, there can be no remission of sins without the shedding of innocent blood. But because it's an animal, the animal's innocent, but it's not the same thing as a real true substitute, a human being, to die in your place for any type of sin that you could ever commit, no matter how terrible of a person you could be that that sacrifice would take the place of it and absorb the full measure of the wrath of God, of his justice and his need to set things straight, to be placed upon. And so these animals had to keep getting sacrificed over and over on a yearly basis because God said it's not good enough, but it's something to get you to the final sacrifice. It was one of the things that God told Abraham was that I will provide a lamb. Speaking of his son, I will provide the substitutionary sacrifice. So the Israelites are directed by God to put in these sacrifices in this big old system with the temple and all of that. So let's fast forward a bit to the days of Solomon and Rehoboam. And this is going to be some interesting tidbits of information that we're just going to say and then we're going to move on and then I'll come back to it later. Rehoboam takes over the kingdom from his father Solomon. But Rehoboam is very foolish and he surrounds himself with bad counselors. He, he surrounds himself with fools. 
and they give him very bad advice. And what happens is they, uh, they, their counsel causes him to make some very stupid decisions concerning the nation, which causes a split. It actually causes the ten tribes of the northern kingdom to split off. And so now, instead of Israel being one country, it becomes two countries now. So now you have the ten tribes in the northern kingdom, and the two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, become the southern kingdom. Now the southern kingdom goes on to be known as Judah, and Jew is short for those of Judah. Okay, so that's what Jews are. That's where Jews come from. The northern kingdom was either called Israel, the house of Israel, or Ephraim, because Ephraim was the biggest tribe there. Um, now, of course, there was a smattering of Levites among the, the whole region. So when we say that there's only two tribes in the southern kingdom, it's kind of like two and a quarter or something like that, because you have Levites spread out throughout there. And so God goes to the king of the northern kingdom, Jeroboam, and he's, he says, I'll give you a covenant and all of this stuff. And, and he does some ignorant, bad decisions. He does some bad things with the northern kingdom, setting up some golden calves and idols and things like that. But moving on through, through history, we get to Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah... God is talking about the northern kingdom, and he talks about these two kingdoms as his wives, as in a, in a way of saying. And he says, you know, this northern kingdom was unfaithful to me. She wasn't a faithful wife to me, and she went off and, and served other gods. And so, basically... In the law, it says if you go off and serve other gods and you don't repent from it, it's real bad. You, you get a, a seven times more uh, sentencing. And so the Assyrian kingdom or empire had come in, destroyed the northern kingdom, carried off the people. And what the Assyrians did was they intermingled populations to keep them under their control. So they would, they would population swap a country. They'd take a population from this region they conquered and swap them with a population that they had conquered over here. And what that does is all the people living in this strange land now have no patriotism for the land that they're living in. And so it was a, it was a control mechanism to try to keep the people from rising up against the Assyrians. So that, that has already happened by the time of Jeremiah. And God's talking about this, this, this northern kingdom, this bride of his. And he's saying, I've divorced her. She's, she's gone. She's, at this point, they are considered Gentiles now. Because Gentile means stranger or one without a covenant. So he still has his wife, Judah, but she's been messing around, and you know she needs to repent, and that, that's that whole Babylonian uh, captivity thing that happened there. But one of the strange things that the Jews always had a hard time with was that in his word he says there that, but he will take back his divorced bride from the northern kingdoms, that he will bring back the northern tribes someday. And that was a serious problem for the Jews. And the reason why it was a problem was because in God's word it says if a wife divorces her husband and then marries a new one and then gets divorced from him, she can't come back to the former husband. It's, it was against the law of God. So they're, they're sitting there thinking, okay, what? how could God go against his own law. He says here that he'll take her back, but how? How could God do this? Because the northern kingdom has gone off and married the other gods, and, and they're Gentiles now. They're completely lost. They're, they've been intermarried and intermingled and mixed among them. We don't even know where, where most of them are now. And so we have this mystery 
and really it is the mystery of the gospel. There's a term that's often used, and, and I know that it can go into other areas, but the mystery of the gospel to the Jewish you know, perspective is how can this good news be true? How can God undo his law, which is perfect and holy and righteous and, and eternal? So, moving on. Now, we come to the Word becoming flesh. God incarnates himself into the womb of Mary. The Bible says that the power of the Lord would overshadow her, and she would conceive and bear a child without a man, because God just inserted himself in that womb. And so Jesus grows up, fully God, but fully man also. He grows up, he lives a sinless life, and he ministers for a period of about three and a half years or so. Most people will agree on that. And he's teaching and he's gathering disciples and so on. But then there comes the time for, for which why he was put into the earth in the first place, which is to stand as that final sacrifice to be in our place so that if there were any possible record, if there was just one little infraction between us and God, or whether there were many, many infractions, many sins, many terrible sins, that no matter what it was, that he would go to the cross and die an innocent person so that he could stand in our place. Okay? All right. Now, Jesus, um, Jesus begins this suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane. In the Garden of Gethsemane, where this begins, God begins to place the sin of the world, of all sin that will ever happen and ever has happened, begins to be put on Jesus. And he begins this time where the wrath of God is going to be poured out onto him. The Bible says that his visage was marred beyond that of any man. In other words, he didn't just die on a cross. He was beaten terribly. His face was distorted from this. You, If you knew Jesus and looked at him, it'd be like, who's that guy? Because he was so bloody and beaten. But I want to talk about something here. I want to read this. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. That's in Luke twenty-two forty-two. 42. Uh, so what is that cup? Well, we'll talk about what that cup is. But the other thing to notice from that verse is that he, he's saying if there's any other way, let it, let it happen so that I don't have to go through this. But the answer was that there was no other way. So again, Jesus is the only way to salvation. Okay, But what is that cup? A lot of people will look at that phrase and and have a general okay yeah like like a saying like the cup of wrath or, or whatever well in numbers chapter 5 there is this thing called the cup of bitterness i wanted to read this passage it's uh yeah i wanted to read the whole passage here it's from verse 11 to 31 but without this context it's kind of hard to understand all right, so then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, If any man's wife goes astray and is unfaithful to him, and a man has intercourse with her, and it is hidden from the eyes of her husband, and she is undetected, although she has defiled herself, and there is no witness against her, and she has not been caught in the act, 
If a spirit of jealousy comes over him, and he is jealous of his wife when she has defiled herself, or if a spirit of jealousy comes over him, and he is jealous of his wife when she has not defiled herself, the man shall then bring his wife to the priest, and shall bring as an offering for her one-tenth of an ephah of barley meal. He shall not pour oil on it, nor put frankincense on it, for it is a grain offering of jealousy, a grain offering of memorial, a reminder of iniquity. Then the priest shall bring her near, and have her stand before the Lord. And the priest shall take holy water in an earthenware vessel, and he shall take some of the dust that is on the floor of the tabernacle, and put it into the water. The priest shall then have the woman stand before the Lord, and let the hair of the woman's head go loose, and place the grain offering of memorial to her in, uh, excuse me, in her hands, which is the grain offering of jealousy. And in the hand of the priest is to be the water of bitterness that brings a curse. The priest shall have her take an oath and shall say to the woman, If no man has lain with you, and if you have not gone astray into uncleanness, being under the authority of your husband, be immune to this water of bitterness that brings a curse. If you, however, have gone astray, being under the authority of your husband, and if you have defiled yourself... And a man other than your husband has had intercourse with you. Then the priest shall have the woman swear with the oath of the curse. And the priest shall say to the woman, The Lord make you a curse and an oath among your people. By the Lord's making your thigh waste away and your abdomen swell. And this water that brings a curse shall go into your stomach and make your abdomen swell and your thigh waste away. And the woman shall say, Amen, Amen. The priest shall then write these curses on a scroll, and he shall wash them off into the water of bitterness. Then he shall make the woman drink the water of bitterness that brings a curse. So the water which brings a curse will go into her and cause bitterness. The priest shall take the grain offering of jealousy from the woman's hand, and he shall wave the grain offering before the Lord and bring it to the altar. And the priest shall take a handful of the grain offering as its memorial offering and offer it up in smoke on the altar. And afterward he shall make the woman drink the water. When he has made her drink the water, then it shall come about. If she has defiled herself and has been unfaithful to her husband, that the water which brings a curse will go into her and cause bitterness, and her abdomen will swell and her thigh will waste away, and the woman will become a curse among her people. But if the woman has not defiled herself and is clean, she will then be free and conceive children. This is the law of jealousy, when a wife, being under the authority of her husband, goes astray and defiles herself. Or when a spirit of jealousy comes over a man, and he is jealous of his wife, he shall then make the woman stand before the Lord, and the priests shall apply all this law to her. Moreover, the man will be free from guilt, but that woman shall bear her guilt. All right, so that was a that's a mouthful there. But what's going on there? Here, here's the issue. The reason why God did this was actually between him and his wife. The swollen belly and the rotting thigh sounds kind of very specifically odd for a, a particular curse. Well, here's the deal. When someone is crucified, they don't die from pain or blood loss, generally. They die from asphyxiation. They literally drown in the own, their own fluids in their lungs that begins to build up. In fact, the word excruciating comes from the word crucifixion. It is, it is an intense pain. It is the most painful way to die. And what happens is, just like if you put water in a balloon, it sags. If you fill the lungs with water, it, it pushes on the diaphragm and pushes the internal organs out and causes a swollen belly. So when Jesus is hanging there on the cross, he receives the curse of the unfaithful woman. Jesus is sitting there, he, he's, he's praying there in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's saying, you know, he's thinking, okay, here we go. 
I'm going to have to drink this cup in the place of the unfaithful wife. In, this, in these people that have not been faithful to me, in these people that have gone astray and done evil things, I could make her drink it, but because I'm merciful, instead, I'm going to drink it in her place. Now, the rotting of the thigh, what does that mean? Well, first of all, when you're on a cross for six hours, uh, you, you basically have to lift yourself up on your legs and your arms to take a breath. So the person's doing squats every time they breathe on there, the way that their arms are stretched out. So from that standpoint, his quads are wasted away. His thighs are, are just done. But in the ancient world, and you'll see this sometimes in Scripture, where someone will grab the thigh when they swear an oath. What that meant was they were swearing on the strength of their legs. It, it, it was indicative of their good name and what they were able to accomplish. So another thing that Jesus had to deal with was as he's hanging there on the cross, people are spitting on him. They're making fun of him. They're mocking him. They're saying, well, if you're the son of God, take yourself down, you know, and all that type of stuff. And so there his good name is being put in the dirt. No one really understands what's going on because they're thinking, well, this guy is supposed to be the king. He, he's supposed to be the king of the Jews. He, here he was. He was our hope that, that, that we would become free from Roman captivity. And, and now he's just dying on a cross. And so they start jeering against him and, and lambasting his name and, and, and who he is. He is mocked. The Most High God is derided. Every, every type of shame. The Bible says that he didn't just suffer and die. He took the shame of sin upon himself. And so that's really what's going on here. This cup of bitterness, this judgment for being unfaithful, he's taking it on for himself, for any unfaithfulness that we have towards God. And, uh, you know, Jesus, you know, he, it wasn't just that. When he was first taken into custody, he was beaten by the Praetorian Guard. Now, the Praetorian Guard were the special forces of the Roman legion. Uh, they were some pretty bad dudes. Um, so just imagine getting locked up with a bunch of Navy SEALs and they just beat you mercilessly all night. That's what That was what Jesus had to go through. Then he was whipped with a cat of nine tails. A cat of nine tails has nine strands on it and they would weave bits of bone and and, and all kinds of sharp objects into those strands. And he got hit with it 39 times. So uh, logic would dictate that they probably ran out of real estate on his back pretty quick. They most likely walked it all the way up his legs and onto the back of his head. Um, they may have even turned him over and done it to the front side. But he was just a tattered, bloody mess. And the Bible says that by his stripes we are healed. And so that sacrifice that he took was for the healing of our physical bodies and even of our minds. Any type of healing act, he took that scourging in our place. Because the Bible says that sickness and disease entered in through sin. So he took and restored everything. Galatians says that the second Adam, that's Jesus, has restored all that the first Adam lost. All right? So perfect health, everything that Adam lost through sin and the fall of the world, Jesus got it back. He restored it all. Not only that, Jesus also had a crown of thorns pressed into his scalp, into his head. Um, and the thorns were really big. It was, a lot of people believe it was from the acacia plant, which has big old thorns. And so you just imagine it's they're sticking into his scalp, scraping right up against his skull, probably popping out in some areas. 
it's on there and it's not coming off. And so there's all of this jeering and mocking and, and all of these things that he's going through. And then he has to carry the giant beam of wood that is this cross down the Via Della Rosa and all the way up the hill on Golgotha. He hasn't slept for 48 hours, give or take. Everyone has left him other than his closest people. Just a few people have stayed with him. And there he is nailed to that cross. It is a testament to the power of God to even survive with that much blood loss, to get himself to that cross. So Jesus died terribly. He, he died a terrible death so that no matter what evil that we have ever done, he took the place. Any punishment that we ever need, any sin consciousness or shame or ridicule or having our names drugged through the mud or any of that, he took our place. And when we choose to give that to Jesus, he can redeem us and give us a new nature. And that new nature causes all things to become old and passed away and all things become new to where we begin walking out that by the grace of God and the power of Jesus Christ. So then Jesus dies. He takes the sin with him to the grave. He's buried and he's buried for three days. And then on the third day, he is raised by the Holy Spirit of God from the dead. And, you know, a lot of people are willing to run with something for a certain amount of time. But when you look at how the disciples and the followers of Jesus who witnessed Jesus after he was resurrected, when you look at them defying death, when, when you see all these people standing for this guy who supposedly didn't raise from the dead, and they're willing to give their lives for it, it makes you wonder, maybe this was the one time that someone actually did raise from the dead. And, and there are plenty of studies and things that go into all of all the acts of the early apostles and how they would stand for Jesus and all of that. But at the end of the day, you can know Jesus. You can know Jesus personally. You know, if someone asks me, how do you know Jesus is real? Well, I'm not going to really give them the answer that, well, we know that Jesus was a real historical figure and, and all of these evidences out there in public. I would say, because I know him, because I talk with him, he's real. He's a real person. He's a real God. And he's healed me many times before. I remember when I was a kid, I had uh, one one leg a little longer than the other, or maybe my, my back was out. I don't know what it was, but brought me up to the front. They prayed over it in the name of Jesus, and I just blinked and boop, just like that. I was healed. There are other times when the Lord has completely healed me of a fever where I am really down, really bad, and all of a sudden, in the name of Jesus, boom, it is as if it never was. And I was at full energy and full strength. There are many people who have been healed of cancer and all kinds of different things. People have missing limbs grow out at the name of Jesus. Deaf people hear at the name of Jesus. Mute people speak. There are all kinds of testimonies all over the place where Jesus has shown up and healed and restored. The Lord is real because he is a really relational God. He is there to be known and you can have a conversation with him. Okay? So if you're if you're if you've never known the Lord, I challenge you, you know, begin to open up to him. Begin to talk with him. And you can even say, okay, if God's real, Show me. Prove it to me. Okay? You can have that type of conversation with him. He's not afraid of that. Okay? So, going back to 
that little thing I mentioned about in Jeremiah, how you had the two countries split apart in that northern kingdom. You know, it, it, uh, it split apart and it's divorced from God. What's with that? Well, Jesus said that he came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Uh, saying house of Israel, he was talking about those ten lost tribes. So, here's the deal. Paul, in Romans 7, explains the mystery of the gospel from the standpoint of the Jewish perspective. And he says right before this passage I'm about to read, he says, for those who understand the law, and this is, this is what he begins to say, for this, uh, for the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Romans 7, 2-3. So what does that have to do with anything? Here's the deal. The one thing that the Jews couldn't figure out was the one thing that was impossible. Okay, God, he can't take back the northern tribes because in his law, this says that she can't come back. It's against the law. But Paul explains it. And he says, oh, but wait, the former husband died. On the cross and so now what happens is this wayward wife that these people this people group are now freed to come back because now they're freed from the law that binds them to this and now Jesus resurrects three days later as this new bachelor that they can leave their former husband, the devil, and come back to. And what the Jews at first, the, the apostles, the disciples, didn't understand, you know, that they were just thinking on the Jewish perspective, the southern kingdom. Oh boy, this is the Messiah, and this is awesome. He came in a different way, and we didn't think about, but yeah, this is real, and, and we're, we're getting baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, and the book of Acts, and all of this. And then God calls Peter to go to this Gentile's house named Cornelius. And Peter shows up, and the Lord's telling him, you know, preach the gospel to him. And so he, he preaches the gospel to Cornelius, this Gentile, and his whole house gets saved. And not only do they get saved, they get baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. So he comes back to Jerusalem, and people are like, we heard you were with some Gentiles. What's going on here? And Peter says, uh, guys, they got tongues. They didn't just, like, there's evidence that they were filled just like we were. And so it hit them, and they realized, oh, I guess this is for the Gentiles too. Well, when God made a way for the Gentile northern kingdom to come back, it opened all Gentiles to come back to the Lord. You know, one of the things that Jesus did during his earthly ministry was send out 70 apostles. Now that might just sound, oh, 70, that's like, you know, God's number seven or something like that. No, it was very specific why he sent out 70 and every second temple period Jew who's living in that day would have known exactly what that meant because after the Tower of Babel there are 70 nations in the table of nations now Deuteronomy 32 8 talks about when the nations were divided according to the number of the sons of God, referencing the Tower of Babel. I don't want to go into all that stuff with the principalities, but here's the deal. When the Tower of Babel happened, God judged them and scattered them. And he disinherited the nations to be run by angels. Well, 
when he sends out 70 apostles, what is an apostle? An apostle is a Roman general. That's what the term comes from, who would be sent to a newly conquered area to turn the culture of those newly conquered people into a Roman culture. That was his job. So when Jesus sends out 70 apostles, he's making a bold statement that he's coming back to conquer the nations, to get the nations back that were disinherited at the Tower of Babel. Okay, So Jesus isn't just coming back for some Jews. He's there for the whole earth. And so this is now opened up for everyone to come back into relationship with Jesus Christ. All right, Romans 1, 16 to 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. So the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It says, If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you're going to heaven. Okay? And what happens, like I said, when you get saved, you're made into a new creature in Christ Jesus. You are literally given a new nature. Jeremiah talks about it as... He's going to take your heart of stone and put a heart of flesh in there instead and write his law on your heart. He resets your conscience. He restores you. He turns you into a different person. So if you, you're thinking, well, this Christianity stuff sounds nice, but it sounds impossible. Like I could never live up to these standards. I'm not, I'm not going to be able to live that way. Well, understand that, yeah, Christianity is impossible, without God. Because when God comes in and restores you and gives you a new nature, you're going to think and look at things differently. And there is an empowerment that happens where grace comes in and empowers you to live out righteously. So I encourage you, whether you have walked away from the Lord for a number of years or however, and you want to come back, or if you've never known the Lord, I want you to know that there was a plan from the beginning from God to save your soul, to cause that bridge to happen through the cross for you to get back to God, that there'd be nothing separating you between you and the Lord. God is holy and he's perfect and he cannot exist around sin. So when the blood of Jesus stands in our place, that allows him to have communion with us because it washes away the record of sin. It, it washes you white as snow. The record of sin is taken away completely. So open your heart today. Listen to the Holy Spirit speaking into your spirit right now and ask him into your heart if you haven't. I encourage you. Begin to talk with him about these things. Say, you know, Jesus, I want to know for sure whether you're real or not. Begin to talk with him, okay? Give him a chance, all right? Because I'm telling you, it worked for my life. It worked for many others. And the only um, regret that I've ever heard from a Christian is, I wish I had come to the Lord sooner, okay? So I'm going to uh, do a prayer real quick. And, and this isn't uh, you know, some special formula, but if you mean it in your heart, you can have Jesus in your heart today. Uh, real quick, though, before I do that, I just want to mention this. You know, the Bible says, save some with fear. In other words, you can preach love and, and all that the Lord did in heaven and all that, and that's great. And that's, that's how most people come into the kingdom. But the Bible does say that some people need to hear the alternative of what happens if you don't have Jesus in your heart. Here's the deal. If you make the willful choice 
to not allow God into your life, to not have Jesus come into your heart and restore you and renew you and cause that communion between you and God. The result is eternal damnation. The result is I've willfully chosen not to have anything to do with God. Okay, well, what does that look like? Everything good comes from Him. So that means you choose everything bad. Okay, this is where the lake of fire or hell comes in. All right, hell is real. The lake of fire is real, and it's a whole lot worse than hell. The lake of fire is an eternal place of suffering and pain because you chose not to live with him. He doesn't want you to go this path, but he will oblige your free will if needed. So here's the deal. Accept Jesus. Because if you don't have a covenant with God, you are not promised tomorrow. The Bible says that tomorrow is promised to no man. Okay, now that's apart from the covenant with God because the Bible says that in wisdom's right hand is long life and fullness of days, and the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. So if you're walking in covenant with God and you're listening to his wisdom, you are promised long life and fullness of days. But if you don't have a covenant with the Lord, you're not promised tomorrow. You don't know what might happen. You have no idea. There could be an aneurysm. There could be a car crash. You could step into eternity today or tomorrow or next week or whenever. And if you don't make that choice to accept Jesus into your heart, you won't have that blood speak for you when you have to stand before God for your sins. And that day will come. And that's why we need the blood of Jesus in our lives. Okay? So let's pray. And if if this is something that you mean in your heart, you will be saved, okay? So, just repeat after me. Father, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I ask that the sacrifice of Jesus happen in my place and for me. And I ask that Jesus will come into my heart. I believe that he died for my sins. I believe that he rose on the third day from the dead and that he can give me eternal life by the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus over myself, over my soul, my spirit. And I ask you, God, now to direct me in how to live for you. Come into my heart and give me relationship. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, so if you have accepted the Lord for the first time or come back to him, get yourself a Bible, begin reading in the book of John about Jesus, and get yourself a good church, a spirit-filled church is best, if you can find one, and get in community because there's strength in community, okay? And begin to talk with the Lord every day spend time with him in prayer and word and and worshiping him and praising him it will unlock things in your life all right god bless you i love you all uh please remember to like and subscribe if you'd like have a merry christmas